Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, this is Alan Tannenbaum of Tannenbaum, LaMole, and Kleinberg. We are, for those of you who don't know us, we are construction lawyers, primarily serving the community association industry. So we take condo and homeowner associations through turnover, uh, assist them with engineering and accounting analyses. We pursue claims against developers for recovery under those circumstances. We also do uh, repair consulting for older groups that are having major repair projects. We help negotiate the contracts with the engineers and with the, with the contractors. We enforce those contracts on behalf of our groups. We also uh, handle uh, complex covenant enforcement actions that the general counsel uh, choose not to take on, we do that uh, as a service to them. Uh, I have with me uh, John LaMole, who's my partner, and Brian Tannenbaum, who's our associate. And we're gonna break the presentation up into uh, segments. I'm gonna handle the first part of the statute. Uh, John, the reserve portion and the roofing issues with insurance and so forth, and Brian, is going to present a, a really helpful timeline at the end. That's a good summary of, of when things have to be accomplished under, under this new legislation. So the Florida legislature, I, I used to work, uh, when I was in law school in Tallahassee, I worked in the Florida legislature. I know how the process works. Uh, it's oftentimes not a very pretty process. In this particular case, it's our understanding that this bill was formulated, passed both houses of the legislature in special session over a course of two days, affecting the condominium industry, engineering field, insurance, construction, um, and, and was produced in, in, in two days. What, which stakeholders were contacted about this bill and the wording of it and so forth is, is an unknown. I know from talking with a number of community association lawyers that uh, the, the lawyers who work in the field, uh, for the most part, were not communicated about this bill. Our input was not received. And we, as a result, got a bill that everybody is, every, everybody is kind of questioning from a number of angles and we're gonna, uh, we're gonna cover that today. So um, why was this legislation passed? And, and before I get too far into it, uh, we're not gonna talk about co-ops today, but everything we say relative to condos is very similar, has a very similar impact on co-ops. So you should be able to extrapolate what we say to a co-op situation. So why was this legislation adopted? Because the legislature, as it indicates in the statute, determined that there was a threat to public health, safety, or welfare, which is a, a fairly easy leap when a condominium building in Surfside collapses and, and, and kills uh, uh, more than 100 people. Uh, it couldn't be a more obvious threat to public health, safety, and welfare. Well, who is the target of the legislation? Uh, as it says in the statute, aging condo and cooperative buildings, three stories or more in height. So that's what the legislature decided to uh, create this legislative uh, work of art to apply the buildings, condo and cooperative buildings, three or more stories in height. So if you're a condo with two stories, you don't need to worry about this legislation. There's also an exemption for, uh, it looks like for condos that are townhomes, uh, they, they also appear to be exempt. And I'll get to that section. So uh, if Brian, if you can go to the first slide. Right, right at the outset of the statute, the uh, legislature stuck this provision in regarding Professional practice standards and liability for managers. 
it seems to reiterate what is already within a contract for management company, which is you have to actually listen to what the board says. So uh, I don't think this uh, ended up creating any greater liability for managers or management companies. Basically says as it, as it relates to these building inspections that are required, the manager or the management firm must comply with these sections as directed by the board. So uh, that's what usually management companies do. So uh, none of us are very excited about 468-4334 as creating any additional liability. Uh, the management companies were already obligated to follow board directives that were within the law and the board telling management we need to get these inspections done. You're not going to find a management manager or management company that will say, no, I'm not going to do it. So we're not particularly concerned. Ryan, if you can go to the next slide. All right, this is where the definitional problems really start. Uh, because the legislature used a number of words of art that uh, are really not well defined. So Milestone inspection, uh, structural inspection, that's pretty understandable. Um, I know what load bearing walls are, but primary structural members and primary structural systems is somewhat vague. Uh, what part of the structural structure is not primary? Uh, it all goes to the support of the building, so I'm not sure that's a great distinction. They probably should have just said the structural members and structural systems. Not sure what primary meant there. Um, they're allowing the inspections to be done by licensed architects or engineers. I'm gonna to get to that issue in a moment as to whether architects are even licensed to do these type of inspections, but I'm gonna to get to that next. Now, this is what the engineer has to attest to. So a, a, a test is engineers standing behind it, they're putting their liability behind it. Um, they have to attest the life safety and adequacy of the structural components of the building to the extent reasonably po possible, only a lawyer can add that to the statute. Determining the General structural condition of the building. Again, I don't know why general is there, but they put it in there as it affects the safety of such building. And then there's gotta be a determination of necessary maintenance, repair or placement of, of a component. But then they add, it's not to determine if it's a compliance with the building code. Well, the building code sets minimum structural requirements. So, it doesn't have to be in compliance with the building code, the structural code. Um, how is it adequate since that's a minimum standard? That's creating some, some vagueness. Um, but let me get to architects for a minute. Brian, if you go to the next slide. So both for the reserve study and for the milestone inspection, it says they can be performed by an architect. But architects can't practice structural engineering. And I've we provided a couple of statutes um, which basically say that. The, the first is the architectural statute, 481.229. The second is the engineering statute. And, and what they basically say is engineers can't practice architecture and architects can't practice engineering the exception is if it's purely incidental to the architectural practice. Well, if an architect is going out and doing a structural inspection, issuing a structural report, uh, that's a stretch to say that's incidental to the architect's practice. What that statute means, in our view, is if an architect is designing a home and there happens to be a structural member that may be incorporated within their design, they can design that structural member because it's incidental to the design of that home. But you're not gonna find an architect who's gonna design a high rise building 
and, and design the structural elements of a high-rise building or a mid-rise building. That would violate their licensure. Well, if they can't do that, they can't inspect those elements and issue a re report about them. So what was the legislature trying to make an exemption to these architectural statutes and the engineering statute? Uh, that's unclear, but the, the big impediment for an architect is, in my experience, there's no way that their insurance, their per professional liability insurance will cover structural inspections. So any architect who shows up at your building saying, I'm ready to perform these inspections, uh, per the per the statute, uh, if one of your requirements is that the architect needs to have liability insurance, professional liability insurance, and he says I do, uh, your next question may be, um, well, uh, can we see a copy of your policy? Because I have an idea that uh, it doesn't cover you as an architect for doing structural engineering or structural inspection. So. Um, I don't think, uh, I, I think the statute is an engineering relief bill. I don't think it's an uh, uh, architect relief bill because I don't think architects in our view can do these inspections and issue these reports, but for whatever reason, the legislature stuck them in there as a, as a possible author of such a study. And I think it would violate their licensure, uh, but certainly I don't think they're insured or could be insured for that. Maybe some architects will disagree with me, but I, I, I'd first ask them to call their uh, liability insurance carriers to see in fact if um, that, that's the case. Okay, uh, let's get on to the next definition. Brian, if you could turn the slide. Substantial structural deterioration. This is where the, again, you know, if, if there are any engineers on the, uh, uh, in this presentation today, you'll probably scratch your head just like we did. Okay, substantial structural deterioration. Um, substantial structural distress that negatively affects the building's general structural condition and integrity. What the heck does that mean? Um, you know, it has the generals in there, it has substantial in there. Uh, that's way open to interpretation. The next sentence says, the term does not include surface imperfections such as cracks, distortion, sagging, deflections, misalignment, signs of leakage, leakage or peeling of finishes, unless the licensed engineer or architect performing the phase one or phase two inspection determines that such surface imperfections are a sign of substantial structural deterioration. Um, that's a legislative pretzel. But my question is, uh, if, if an engineer goes up and looks at a balcony slab and it's distorting, sagging and deflecting, what are the, or misaligned, what are the chances that that engineer is gonna say, um, that's not a sign of substantial structural deterioration. I mean, a sagging slag or, sla or a sagging structural member or a deflecting structural member or a misaligned structural member, um, what engineer in the right mind is gonna say, well, I saw sagging deflection misalignment, but, uh, but I'm not calling it a sign of substantial structural imperfection. So, uh, I'm sure the engineers are scratching their heads about all of that uh, termination or, 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 or terminology. And Brian, if you can go to the next slide. Um, here's the web, and, and Brian Tannenbaum is going to cover at the end uh, the, uh, the, the timelines on, on these inspections. But again, um, for each building that's three stories or more in height, by December 31st of the year, the building reaches 30 years of age. Uh, the milestone inspection has to be done and every 10 years thereafter. But if the building is located within three miles of, of a coastline, 
which is an interesting measurement of, of exactly what that means. Um, I guess it's if there's a portion of the coastline that juts inward that you're stuck being within three miles, uh, you have to have it within 25 years and then every 10 years uh, thereafter. Now, one of the questions that you might have is, we just had an inspection done two years ago. Uh, do, we, uh, do we get another 10 years or do we have to do this inspection again? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. I would go back to the same engineer and say, can you uh, reinspect our building and uh, issue a report that complies now with the new statute? They won't have to reinvent the wheel by doing the entire inspection over again, but it's probably good to get the report that, that complies with the statute, even if they issued a report because it doesn't have all the criteria that, that is included in the report. So you probably will have to get the, bring that engineer back to, uh, uh, to do it again. Uh, the association has to arrange for the inspection to be performed. That's pretty obvious. Um, the association responsible for all co costs associated with the inspection, that's pretty obvious. Uh, but this is where there's an exemption for, it looks like townhome buildings that are three-story in height, that are, in, that are uh, part of a condominium regime, it looks like they're exempt from the statute the way I read this. I don't know what else would be a single family, two family or three family dwelling with three or more habitable stories above the ground. Um, so it sounds like a three story townhome building that's condo probably does not uh, have to comply with the requirements of the statute, the way we read that. Okay, uh, Brian, we go to the next slide. Um, there's an exemption um, for certain buildings that were where the CO was issued before July 1st of 1992, it gives them until the end of December of 2024 to comply, um, which is funny because now some of the older buildings have a later deadline than ones that were uh, where the CO was issued in August of 92. They have to have an inspection quicker than ones that were before that, that's just an anomaly in the statute. Okay, now here's where you get the billing department involved. Um, the building department's gotta determine that a building must have a milestone inspection. So now the building department's gotta keep a record of all the buildings and their ages within the, within the jurisdiction of the building department. And they have to provide written notice uh, that the association is required to have the inspection done. So you have the building department involved. And once that request is made, the association has 180 days to complete phase one of the milestone inspection. Well, you, you don't wait until the building department tells you, you've got to meet the dictates of the statute, but this is, I guess, is a protection to make sure that they do occur, you get the building department involved. But here's the problem. Um, some engineers, uh, well, they are all, all very busy. Are you gonna be able to get them out within uh, six months when every older condo association in the state is mandated to do these inspections? Um, they, they don't have enough engineers on their staffs to handle the current workload this imposes an even greater workload on them. Uh, you're gonna have a hard time getting engineers out uh, to not only undertake the inspection, but to complete it within uh, 180 days. So that's gonna be a real challenge. Um, now, here's where they've created liability for directors. And uh, I, I understand it, why the legislature did this, but it's gonna create a real burden on getting people to serve on board of directors of older buildings because it says that the officers and directors who willfully fail to have the inspection performed, 
The failure is a breach of their fiduciary duty to the owners, which could, and John Lamol is gonna go into it a little deeper, is gonna uh, create potential liability. Um, I guess the message is comply with the statute, have your inspections done. If, uh, your, if your owners uh, protest, pull out the section of the statute and say, look, uh, I'm the one who's subjected to the potential liability. If you want to, um, if you want to get out there uh, and have the liability, take my seat on the board. So uh, managers, uh, take this section of the statute. Board members, take this section of the statute. If you're getting resistance among your owners about spending the money to undertake these inspections, uh, you need to uh, pull out this section because it creates significant liability. Now, what's interesting um, for your fiduciary insurance that you, you purchase, make sure that there's no exclusion for this type of liability. Uh, so you should check with your carriers, see what those policies say about potential liability under, under these, the, the section. And again, what happens if, you know, you try to get an engineer out by, by, uh, under the date sequence that the legislature called for it, and you just can't get an engineer uh, to be out there. Um, what, what is it that you, um, what is it that you can do? Okay, um, let's move to milestone inspection. Brian, if you can go to the next phase one. Um, all right, so this is the first inspection required. Again, it talks about an architect. I don't think they can do them. But uh, again, the architects may disagree, but I don't think their licensure would support them doing this type of examination. So this, the phase one is a visual examination. Now, here's what's odd. How do you do a visual examination that includes the major structural components of a building? Because the major structural co components of the building are for the most part hidden from view, are behind finishes. So what, what is a visual examination of the, the structural components of the building. That means you, you can see the balconies. Uh, you might see a garage column, but you can't, you can't visualize the internal columns in a building because they're behind building finishes. Uh, you can't see the roof deck because it's under the roof. So, so what, what really does this visual examination uh, provide? The other issue about it is and we've, we've been to buildings, uh, let's say wooden structures, where uh, the exterior facade looks pretty good. But behind, behind the facade, the, there's rotted wood. So the visual inspection may tell you very little about what the actual structural condition of a building is. So I don't know um, the great advantage of uh, of the milestone inspection. Um, but here's again the, the problem with the engineer for the engineers. If they find no signs of substantial structural deterioration, um, then no phase two inspection is required. And what engineer in his right mind is going on a visual inspection, going to attest the fact that, hey, I don't see any uh, major structural condition here. Um, they're gonna be inclined almost in every case to say you need a phase two, because I'm not putting my seal on a, on a report that says, you know, looks great to me, only to have uh, a port part of the building collapse or a major structural problem show up a couple of years later and then everybody's looking to the engineer about what they missed. So uh, the impetus is going to be on the engineers to go and recommend the phase two study or not be willing to undertake these engineering examinations at all. Uh, and uh, 
So, you know, I, I question the, the, the phasing there. But then we go to phase two. So if they engineer says in their phase one report, oh, I have to look deeper. I can't make an analysis. I think that these can, there could be signs of structural deterioration that I can't see. Then you go into the phase two inspection and it may involve destructive or non-destructive testing at the inspector's direction. Inspection may be as extensive or as limited as necessary to fully assess areas of structural distress in order to confirm that the building is structurally sound and safe for its intended use and to recommend a program for fully assessing and repairing distressed and damaged portions of the building. Okay, so if an engineer does a phase two and doesn't go far enough and structural problems occur after that, they're gonna get blamed for that. They're gonna get sued for that. Um, so what the statute has set up is uh, really the impetus on the part of the engineer to direct the most extensive destructive testing possible so that when they put their seal on that report, they're very, very confident that the building is structurally sound. So um, that, that it, it, it creates a massive liability. Their bias is going to be, we need to go much deeper into this, or I don't want to do these inspections at all because there's, there's too much liability potential. Um, now here's a strange section that somebody stuck on to this paragraph. When determining testing locations, the inspector must give preference to the locations that are the least disruptive and most easily repairable while still being representative of the structure. Okay, so again, I don't know exactly what that means, but it sounds like it's, a, it's an open door for owners to complain about the extent of the engineering inspection and to go to court and say, the engineer who's doing our building is not complying with the section because they've chosen locations that are disruptive and not easily repairable. And, and therefore we're allowed to stop this job or this inspection process because it doesn't meet that condition of the statute. So there's a lot of danger in the legislature having added that section in uh, as to exactly who can enforce it. Um, but let me go quickly into the next section, milestone inspection. And I'm sorry, uh, we're gonna be limited on the questions that we can take because we have a lot of material to go through. Um, the milestone inspection report. There's gotta be a report for phase one. If you go to phase two, there's gotta be a report for phase two. Um, it's gotta be uh, sealed, it has a summary. And the summary requirements, what has to be in it is in this section. Um, it has to identify any substantial structural deterioration within a reasonable professional probability based on the scope of the inspection, it has to describe the deterioration, identify recommended repairs, uh, state whether uh, unsafe or dangerous conditions exist, which the bias is gonna to be to say that they do, because if you don't say that, and the building has a problem two years later, you're gonna get sued for that. Um, recommend remedial measures. Um, and then the report has to be distributed to the owners. Uh, it has to be available in association records. It has to be posted. Um, and uh, so you have all of those requirements for this report. If you go quickly to the next slide, Brian, the milestone inspection, uh, local enforcement agency can prescribe timelines and penalties, but then it switches to the board of county commissioners. So now the county is involved and not the cities and the county can adopt an ordinance uh, requiring schedules for the commencement of the repairs. Uh, but in either case, the repairs have to be commenced within 365 days after that phase two report is received, which again, uh, is it possible even in today's market for that timeline to, to be met? 
Uh, and then it, it, if you can't submit proof that the repairs have been done, uh, the enforcement agency can review and determine the building is unsafe for uh, human occupancy. So uh, I'm gonna hand the ball off to John Lamol at this point to talk about reserves, but uh, what you're gonna be hit with is engineering firms who are willing to even do this work are gonna give you limitations of liability in their contracts. And more importantly, they're gonna ask for indemnification. They're going to require that the association indemnify them against any liability if they want these to be done. And the associations need to talk to their liability carriers to make sure that your liability insurance covers an indemnification that you may give to the engineer who's doing these inspections. Otherwise, uh, it may not be covered by your liability insurance policy, the indemnification, and, and the owners are gonna be exposed for defense costs and, and potentially great liability. So uh, right now I'm gonna hand it off to John Lamont to talk about reserves. Good morning, everybody. Brian King Flip, thanks. So we're gonna talk about a whole different type of report. Um, and, and despite the, uh, the, the similarity uh, to, uh, in, in, in its name, Structural Integrity Reserve Study, uh, sure sounds like the type of thing that's also contemplated by the milestone report. I don't, I don't want anybody to, to misunderstand that this is, a, this is a separate report that condominiums uh, and co-ops are going to have to undertake and they have somewhat different time frames. Whether these can be done by the same person, by the same engineer, in conjunction, you know, together with a milestone report, it's all going to depend upon the age of the uh, of the uh, of the um, uh, of the buildings versus the age of the condominium itself. Because a structural integrity report, a reserve study, as you'll see, is tied not to the time that the building was uh, was completed, but by the but tied back to the creation of the condominium. So let's talk about what a structural integrity reserve study is. And really, this study is directed at the financial end uh, of the issues that emanated out of the Champlain Towers collapse, which is the financial mismanagement, perhaps the the lack of reserve funding for providing major structural repairs and all of the problems that have been uh, determined and, and we've seen arise when associations waive or reduce reserve funding. And that's really what this is intended to fix. So 718.103, that's where the definitions are in the Condominium Act and it, and it, and it shifted some things around. So, so it creates this new subsection 25. I don't want anybody to think that it replaces what was already previously there as 25. It just kind of moves everything beyond past 25 down a little bit. Uh, and then it adds as a, a, a new definition, a structural integrity reserve study. What is it? It's a study of the reserve funds required for future major repairs and replacement of the common areas based on a visual inspection of the common areas. Okay, so similar to the phase one milestone report, this is a report that's solely based on visual inspection. And it's a, a structural integrity reserve study may be performed by any person qualified to perform such study. However, and this is important, the visual inspection of the portion of the structural integrity reserve study must be performed by an engineer licensed under chapter 471 or an architect licensed under chapter 481. Why do they make that distinction? Well, because you may have portions of a reserve study which really are more CPA driven, uh, you know, or, or, you know, functions that, and, and, you know, we know that there are certain companies that, out, that are out there that perform reserve studies uh, and look at the financial aspects of how to, uh, 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 how, you know, how to project out what needs to be assessed for reserves. But because this is now tied to a structural uh, and, uh, you know, uh, an inspection of the property, the visual part of the inspection, upon which the reserve calculations are going to be determined 
has to be done by an engineer or an architect. Um, I'm not going to go into what Alan talked about before about the difference between what an architect, architect can do and an engineer can do because theoretically that might be the same problem here. What's got to be con what, what needs to be contained in the structural integrity reserve study? At a minimum, it must identify the common areas being visually inspected. It has to state the estimated remaining useful life and the estimated replacement cost or deferred maintenance, maintenance expense of the common areas being visually inspected and provide a recommended annual reserve amount that achieves the estimated replacement cost or deferred maintenance expense. Now I've highlighted this language because I think it's gonna be very important of each, and I want you to pay attention to the word each, of each common area being visually inspected by the end of the estimated remaining useful life of each uh, of each common area. And there, there was a, it's one, it's folks, it's one little word in the statute. They changed the to each. Uh, and I think that's going to be important because a lot of folks have been asking a question about component funding versus pooled uh, reserve funding. And I think, I th and I'm going to talk about that in a second, but I think that's an important distinction. Can we go to the next slide? What needs to be in a, what, what gets inspected in a, in a structural integrity reserve study? And when must it be done? So a structural integrity reserve study must be completed every 10 years after the condominium's creation. Pay attention to that language that I've highlighted, after the condominium's creation. When is a condominium created? Uh, in the statute, a condominium is created when the declaration is recorded. Okay, so this isn't tied to building CO. This is tied to when the condominium came into existence. So you have to complete this study every 10 years after creation for each building on the condominium property that is three stories or higher in height. So three-story buildings every 10 years after creation. And the study has to include, and there's a list at subsection G, it's uh, 718, it's, it's what will be the new 718.112 subsection G. And the things that need to be included in this reserve study are a little bit more expansive than what used to be in, you know, in, in, in what, what continues to exist for under two-story buildings, uh, but now is changed for three-story or higher buildings. So this study has to look at the roof, load-bearing walls, other primary structural members. We already talked about that a little bit about milestone inspections. The floor, the foundation, fireproofing and fire protection systems, plumbing, electrical, waterproofing, and exterior painting, windows. And then again, it has the catch-all of any other maintenance, uh, any other item of, that has a deferred maintenance expense or replacement cost that exceeds $10,000 and the failure to replace or maintain such item negatively affects the items listed in the above paragraphs. So if it's more than $10,000 to maintain it, and it may negatively impact the roof or the floor or the foundation, that's got to be included. And these are determined by the engineer or the architect performing the visual portion of the structural integrity reserve study. So really the professionals, the engineer and the architect is going to be driving what are they going to look at in the visual uh, in their visual inspection that they're going to be doing for your structural integrity reserve study? Okay, so if you got to do these studies, it's a it's a study that's going to involve a professional, an architect or an engineer. There's going to be a, a a very deep you know very detailed visual inspection of your buildings. And you got to do it every 10 years after creation of the condominium. Now, go to the next slide, please, Brian. <clears throat> Let's talk about how this is going to kind of be phased into existence. Uh, first of all, the act is effective on July 1st of 2022, so a little less than a month from now. So who's going to have to do these and when? Well, developers are going to have to do one now for buildings that 
are re that require a structural integrity reserve study. I think we're probably all going to be calling this SIRS in a SIRS in no long, uh, in, in in no short order. But um, so again, three story buildings. The developer before the developer turns control over to unit owners, the developer must have a structural integrity reserve study completed for each building on the condominium property that is three stories or higher in height, okay? So every turnover is gonna involve one of these reports now. Uh, for associations under unit owner control and which exist before July 1st of this year. So if you've got an association that has buildings three stories or higher, it's under unit owner control. It was created before July 1st. Those associations are going to have to have their, their structural integrity reserve study completed by December 31st, 2024. Again, for each building on a condominium, on the condominium property that is three stories or higher in height. Before turnover, okay, so, so that, that's, that's how we're going we're gonna to phase this in, okay? Um, so developers need to do it. Unit owner controlled associations existing, created prior to July 1st, they're going to have until December 31st, 2024. Anything that's unit owner controlled and existing after July 1st, 2022, you're, you're under the 10-year regime. Okay, so you're gonna have to look back and see when your condominium was created to, in order to determine when, when you're gonna to need to comply with this. Now, the other thing that the legislature did in implementing this is they made a major overhaul of reserve funding requirements. So let's talk about that. Before turnover of control by the developer to the unit owners, and, 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 and the statute doesn't make a distinction here between any type of condominium, doesn't talk about whether there are, you know, three-story higher buildings or not, doesn't talk about whether, you know, uh, any whether, whether it's a building that requires a structural integrity reserve study or not. Before turnover control of control of an association by a developer to unit owners other than developer, the developer-controlled association may not vote to waive reserves or reduce funding of the reserves. Effective December 31st, 2024, a unit owner controlled association may not determine to provide no reserves or reserves uh, uh, less or less reserves than are required. That's an important thing, you know, that's changed in this statute. And then Effective December 31st of 2024, the members of a unit owner controlled association may not vote to use reserve funds or any interest accruing thereon for purposes other than their intended, pur uh, other than their intended purpose. Now, the question has come up about component funding versus pooled funding. Now, let me start by saying we're construction lawyers. We don't typically get involved with budgeting. Ever, we really don't ever get involved with budgeting decisions. Uh, these are really questions that you should be directing to your general general counsel. So I want you to take you know take that very important point back with you. Go talk to you know to the general counsel that that represents your association and ask them for their opinion on the funding issue. It appears that because of the word each common element area or each you know each area that needs to be reserved and and the change of the to each it appears as though the legislature is intending for component funding that's not clear in the statute and so you're going to you're going to need to go back to your general counsel and when you're making these budgeting decisions you need to consult with them and get their opinion and their recommendation on that i would also say that it appears that the legislation is intended to require that reserves be, you know, that 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 you can't um, borrow reserves from a different reserve fund for a different element to pay for something 
you know, for, for you can't borrow from the roof reserves to pay for the, uh, you know, a, a, a foundation reserve or an electrical reserve. Uh, but that's not entirely clear in the statute. So, so I really want you to, you know, take this in very important disclaimer and takeaway when you're sitting down to do your budgeting and make your budgeting decisions and start looking at, at your reserve requirements, sit down with your general counsel, get their take on what this legislation intends. Um, and, and certainly there may be some additional guidance that we'll get from the legislature going forward. Maybe some case law will, will come down interpreting this. So, um, so I, I think the jury's still out, as they say, on that issue. Next statute. Uh, next slide, sorry. Um, and, and just like with milestone inspections, the legislature has put an important provision in here about fiduciary duty. And so if an association fails to complete a structural integrity reserve study pursuant to this paragraph, such failure is a breach of an officer's and, and director's fiduciary relationship to the owners. Now, again, that's not entirely clear what that means. Uh, and certainly you should be talking to general counsel and getting their perspective on this. Um, as you all may know, there's a section in 718111, um, which defines a officer or director's fiduciary duty and when that is breached. And there are certain limitations on that. And, and, and you know, generally they involve self-interested dealings. Uh, they involve um, uh, rec you know, reckless acts uh, or an act or, or omission that was in bad faith or with a malicious purpose or in a manner exhibiting wanton and willful disregard of human rights, safety, or property. Now, I will tell you that in this section here on fiduciary duty, it refers in the actual statutory language, it does refer back to the, uh, uh, the corporate fiduciary duty language and, and statute. And, and so um, I think there's a tie in there to this structural integrity reserve study and the part of the statute which, uh, which of the original and existing statutes regarding fiduciary duty, which talk about, and in particular, the manner, you know, a, a breach which exhibits wanton or willful disregard of human rights safety, because that's what this is directed to, safety or property. Uh, so I think the legislature here was trying to further define, um, you know, where officers and directors have a fiduciary duty to make sure that these studies are being, uh, being done. Okay, so that's, that's um, reserve studies, that's uh, structural integrity, reserve study, reserve funding. Now, I, I've been asked this, uh, and, I, and there's probably questions in the chat if I look at them. Okay, I have a building that's not three stories or higher. Then what do I do? Well, the legislature kept the same reserve budgeting language in there um, and, so, and, and, and then added the structural reserve study uh, language. And as we know, that applies to buildings that are three stories or higher. So if you have a building that's not three stories or higher, it would appear that the same old statute that you've been dealing with all along um, in terms of what needs to be reserved for is undisturbed. Again, it's not entirely clear. There's a little ambiguity there. And so again, talk to general counsel, get their perspective on it when you sit down to start doing your budgeting and reserve calculations. Um, but it's definitely clear that reserve, waiving reserves and, and, and or lessening reserves, um, regardless of the building, uh, are, are gonna be a big no-no in the future. All right, uh, so that's, that's the condo safety uh, portion of this presentation concluded. Now, what was also in, uh, included in this special session and what came out of it is some relief under uh, uh, an insurance bill that provides, provides some insurance relief and some provisions regarding roof repairs and replacement. I don't wanna get into all the particulars of the insurance bill except as they may relate to roof replacements because that's been a really, really difficult issue for, for associations lately. And this applies to all associations. 
Um, it used to be under the Fed, under the Florida Building Code that if you had to repair or replace 20, more than 25% of an existing roof, you had to redo the entire roof. Okay, we're all pretty familiar with that. What the legislature did in the condos in, in the in the new uh, in the new bill is that they've 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 relaxed that a little bit. If your roof was installed under the 2007 Florida Building Code or later, and you have a roof replacement or repair that impacts more than 25% of your roof, you're not required to do the whole roof. You can do the report that you can repair or replace the portion that needs to be repaired or replaced. So that's a very different thing than we've been dealing with for, for a long time in Florida. I will tell you that there's a lawsuit that was just filed uh, challenging the constitutionality of this provision and some other provisions. So we'll see whether this survives uh, survives uh, judicial review. Um, now, everybody's talking about, I can't get, re my carrier won't renew my insurance because my roof is 15 years old. Uh, so there's some relief in this bill uh, if you're, uh, if, if starting on July 1st, 2022. So if you've had this problem before July 1st of 2022, I'm sorry, but um, uh, you, may, you, may, you may still have to deal with the difficulties that you've been dealing with. But the takeaway here is that an insurer may not refuse to issue or refuse to renew a homeowner's policy insuring a residential structure with a roof that is less than 15 years old solely because of the age of the roof. Now they can come in and say, well, there's all kinds of other problems with the roof, but they can't non-renew you if your roof is under 15 years of age just because of the age of the roof. If your roof is more than 15 years old and they come in and they say, we're not gonna renew you because your roof is over 15 years old. Well, you can now get an inspection. And as long as that inspection is done by an authorized inspector, and those folks uh, are, you know, uh, a, a licensed home inspector, a licensed general building or residential contractor, a professional engineer, an architect, and the statute says, or anyone approved by the insurer. Um, if you can get that inspection done and it says, and the inspector concludes that the roof has five or more years of useful life remaining, uh, then the insurer cannot refuse to renew your coverage um, on the basis, you know, of the roof being more than 15 years old, as long as you have a report that says that the roof still has five or more useful uh, years of life remaining. John, okay. uh, so, the, yeah. it should be noted that there's already been two lawsuits filed by uh, the roofing industry attacking this, the that particular requirement about the 15 years of roofers want the 15 year replacement provision to remain in. And they've all already filed suit to attack it on the basis that the legislation covered too many topics. Um, it was not a single topic legislation. And so that's up, uh, already up for challenge. Yeah, um, and, and, and sorry. Go ahead. No, and, 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 the, and the other part of that, uh, of, of that challenge is the roofing industry is concerned that um, that uh, in, in, you know in situations where the roof uh, where they think the roof needs to be replaced be, you know that the insurers are going to resist that because you know they now have the they can use this section as a proverbial sword instead of a shield and say well we're not going to provide insurance funds uh, because the roof doesn't need to be completely replaced under this new statute we can we can replace only part of it. Uh, and a contractor may think otherwise and say, well, you know, no, we really need to have the entire roof replaced. Um, and obviously the, the roofing industry has some self-interest here because they'd rather do full roof replacements uh, than partial roof replacements. So they're challenging that. We'll see what happens with that with that challenge and how the John, court rules um, on it. But they let's, let's give Brian, a, a, he worked hard on this timeline. Brian, why don't you put up your timeline? So, I don't have much, I don't have much to say. Let's get the, let's get the question since we're out of time. Okay, so um, what, what, what we provide here, and again, this, this outline is available, just email us, but uh, Brian did this very effective timeline 
that will need to be followed. So it's a good checklist to have. So uh, just email us and we can, we can provide it. Uh, we'll, we'll go a little bit of over time because I know there are a lot of questions and we, we tried to cram in all the material uh, to fit within uh, 55 minutes. And um, John, I'm gonna let you handle the reserve questions because they're the toughest one. And you studied it a little bit closer than mine. Um, the, I'm gonna answer Robert Smith's question. Does a, a licensed engineer or architect need to do a visual inspection on buildings two stories or less for purposes of a reserve study? Uh, what, what do you say to that one, John? You're on mute. Sorry, what was the question again, Alan? Two stories or less, do they have to do a reserve study? No, um, the, the, the structural integrity reserve studies for three-story buildings or, or higher. Okay, but you gotta do your normal reserve. Uh, you gotta do your normal reserves, correct. Yeah. Alan, uh, and, you, and, you, and you can't reduce after after 2024. You after 2023, starting in 2024, you cannot reduce for this is for all buildings. You can't reduce or waive reserve funding. Right. <clears throat> okay, Alan. This is June from Sunfish Bay. I have a question. The way our condo is set up. Yeah, there's a bottom floor where people live, and then there's a second floor. The second floor has an upstairs. Is that considered a three-story building? Is it a full story, the third floor? Um, no, it's partial. It's like a loft and um, half bath. It's well, like four. Story, you're, you're, you're probably okay, but that's, that's an interesting question. Um, but you're probably okay. It's not a full story, so it sounds like it's less than three stories, but... Who knows? Let somebody challenge it. We'll see what a court says. Um, let's see. Like, uh, is a three-story I mean, there's, there's multi-family condo there's... is a three-story multi-family condo subject to milestone inspection requirements? Yes. If it's multi-family, yes. The only exception would be like con uh, condos that are townhouses probably would not be required if they're three-story. But if it's a condo building that has more than three families in it uh, and it's three stories, it would be required to have the inspection. Um, let's see. Will the milestone inspection report suffice as the inspection for the structural integrity reserve study? And then a reserve specialist can complete the remaining life and cost estimates. Darlene, that's, that's a difficult question. Um, Yes, I would say that if you did both at the same time, if you did the milestone inspection report, uh, that probably could serve as the basis for uh, the portion of the reserve study that has to do with the structure. So yes, I think you can combine that information uh, and, it, and, it, and it would suffice. Um, and then the reserve specialist can do the rest of it, yes. Um, <laughs> The question, what is considered three miles from the coast? Um, because, uh, you know, our, our coast is not a uniform, uh, it's not a uniform line. So, you know, if, if it's normally three miles from the coast, but there's an inlet that, that kind of juts in, uh, you know, are you now qualifying as being within three miles of the coast? The legislature did not define what the coast was. So um, people are gonna be getting their measuring tapes out. It is It is actually defined as uh, the it line is. of mean low water along the portion of the coast that is in direct contact with the open sea and the line okay. marking the seaward limit of inland waters as well. Okay, oh, well, Brian has pointed out they do have a definition. But he uses the word C, so I guess the Gulf of Mexico is not required to meet uh, the requirements. So I don't, because <laughs> it's not a C. And then somebody says that the coast, a major river, no, I don't think it would apply to a major river. It's talking about the uh, coast of Florida, not the coast of an inland river. Um, for roof replacement and insurance over 15 years, does it have to be inspected by an engineer? Um, I think John answered this. It's a qualified 
roofing inspector. Uh, so it does not necessarily have to be an engineer. That's correct. Uh, the That's correct. Question, our windows are not common area in our docks. How do we handle that? Um, I, 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 that's a good question. I, I don't know if you would have to reserve for them, even though the statute does require it. Uh, by the way, uh, every time you anybody asks us whether it's a good idea for your windows to be maintainable by the owners, I will tell them no. Um, and, and every situation where you have documents that have the owners maintaining their own windows, uh, those those properties have had problems because if an owner doesn't maintain their windows, where does the water go? It goes into the unit below or maybe the two units below. Uh, but that's an interesting question. I'll let your general counsel uh, tackle that one in your, in your documents. I don't have an immediate, I don't have immediate clarity on that question. Uh, John, why don't you answer this one uh, from Aaron? If a condo over three stories performed a reserve study last year, and if what was covered meets the requirement of the current reserve requirement under the statute, do they have to do a new one anyway? Well, again, it's going to be all, it's, it's, it's tied. If we're talking about the structural integrity reserve study, it's tied to when the condominium was created. Uh, is it, is it, you know, I'm, I'm presuming it's unit owner controlled. So if it existed before July 1st, 2022, it's under unit owner control. Then by December 31st, 2024, you have to comply. And, and it's in three stories. You have to comply with the structural integrity reserve study requirement. Now, um, uh, you know, is, is your is your existing reserve study compliant with that with that that new structural integrity reserve study, I it depends. Um, you know, there's was there a visual inspection by by an engineer or architect uh, of the components that need to be required in the study. So you're really going to have to go back to who did the study, uh, talk to your general counsel, look at the study, and determine whether it hits all the, you know, the the hits all of the the items that need to be in there whether it's based on a visual inspection by an engineer um, and whether importantly, whether it sets out a, and, and again, this gets back to the component versus pooled, you know, how are we calculating reserves? Cause there are very different ways about calculating what the reserves should be, how they're, you know, how they're allocated, how, and how we're going, how the association is going to assess for them. So, um, you know, the, these are all kind of technical issues, and I can't really say whether that report's going to qualify or not. Um, I would tend to believe it probably it might not. Okay. Um, the uh, does a one-story building within three miles of the coast is it affected by the statute? No. But you again, you still have to do your normal reserve study, mm -hmm. but but nothing affected by this particular legislation. Um, if an inspection discovers a structural defect, it would need to be repaired and replaced immediately, regardless of cost. Um, I have to say yes to that question. And, uh, you know, I, we, we have a whole different presentation on condo termination. And what's going to happen with some of these older condos, frankly, is that the owners are going to see the price tag on repairing uh, an older building that, or older buildings that uh, need an enormous amount of money to revitalize and meet the conditions of the report. And uh, the owners are gonna have to think seriously in some cases about voting to terminate the condo, selling the property and dividing the proceeds rather than trying to, trying to keep a very old patient alive. Uh, except the fact that every condo in Florida, especially the ones on the coast, at some point in time are going to be terminated uh, and, and not and, and at a point when they're no longer repairable. Now where the <clears throat> church or any particular building, I don't know, but yes, if the report says you got to repair it, you got to raise the money and repair it. 
And there's going to be situations where owners cannot afford that. Uh, and you're going to have banks taking back some units and you're going to have, we're going to have a real mess uh, in some properties. So to avoid that, uh, uh, groups may have to think very seriously about termination and very drastic circumstances. Uh, is a building that has a ground floor as a parking garage and three floors of condos above considered to be a four-story building? I would say yes. Um, for two-story condos, are pulled reserve calculations still allowed? I would say yes. Um, will the requirements of the reserves based upon the new statute uh, increase cost requirements, trump the documents regarding the limit of an increase in assessment of 115% without approval of the membership? Um, I would say that Yes, the, the requirement for maintenance and repair is a statutory requirement, which has predominance over any restrictions in your documents. So uh, if, 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 the, if there's an assessment that increases uh, the, or, uh, uh, by 150% and an owner attacks it saying this violates our documents, in my view, they're gonna if they go to circuit court with that, they're gonna lose because the statutory requirement for repair predominates over any documentary restrictions. So I think that would be a very poor attack by those owners, and frankly, a very poor excuse by the board to say, well, we want to comply with the statute, but we can't because our documents don't allow us. Um, just pull out that fiduciary duty section, and um, and that's again that's gonna that's gonna predominate. Um, what's always interesting too is that if you get if you get financing and don't assess, does that does that trump any uh, assessment increase requirement? That may be a way out if you're if you're um, if your defaults on your assessment collections are very low and you can get financing, uh, you probably could get around that 115% requirement anyway. Um, is there anywhere where the details of the milestone inspection are defined? Yes, in the statute and the definition is pretty vague. So good luck. Uh, maybe the legislature will help with that or maybe there'll be a court decision one day, but. Right now, you're stuck with the statutes, what the statute says. Um, can we hold a board meeting, executive session, or something similar to discuss these issues before firing up the owners? I like that terminology. Um, there's no such thing in condo land as an executive session. It's, it's the unicorn of condominium operation. There's only board meetings where anytime a majority of the board get together to discuss association business, it's a board meeting, has to be noticed. Um, if, it's, if it's less than majority of the board, let's say you have a management committee that has a five person board, you have two board members and three non-board members, you could probably get away with that as a committee uh, without noticing, but uh, there's no such thing as an executive session of the board, it's a board meeting either way. Um, and uh, the only exception is you call your general counsel and say we want to discuss possible claims and you can have a session with them without the owners being involved um, but maybe the owners should be fired up uh, here's a question should, shouldn't we wait until all the lawsuits and ambiguous language is flushed out before enacting the inspection not a good idea um because it, it, the lawsuit could be filed against you and your association. So I wouldn't wait until there's been lawsuits and adjudications or legislative changes to comply with the statute, if that was the implication. Uh, is two stories over parking considered three stories? I would think it is, yes. If the first story of parking is a full story, then that's a three-story building, in my view. 
Um, all right. Uh, Can I just clarify the pooled reserves issue? But what the statute says is that members of a unit owner controlled association may not determine to provide no reserves or less reserves than required for items listed in paragraph G, which is the structural uh, reserve study. It doesn't limit it to three story and above. So it would appear that any of those items cannot be, reserves cannot be waived for. And they need to be kept separately. Um, Michelle says, email our question. It looks like she wants us to get done. Brett, John, do you want to answer that one last question from Chrissy Nelson? Do you see it? Where roof is more than 15 years old. Do you see that one? Uh, can you read it to me? Because okay, I don't, where I don't roof know where is you... more than where roof is more than 15 years old, and an insurance company is threatening to discontinue coverage based on the age of the roof, and in the event that an engineer certifies that the roof has at least five more years of remaining life, how much longer does the insurance company have to continue coverage? Does that make sense to you? Um. <laughs> Well, that's a good question. Um, you know, you, you get renewed year over year. So, so the statute simply says that if, you're, if your non-renewal is solely due to the age of the roof and your roof is over 15 years, uh, you can get a report that says, and if the report says you have five more useful years of life, um, then the then the carrier cannot uh, non-renew you that year. So that's a pretty good question. Does that give you a five-year pass? I don't, I don't know. It doesn't say. It's kind of uh, up in the air. Do you have to then go back next year and say, okay, I need another, uh, I need another inspection that says I have five more years of useful life? Well, number one, the insurance carrier probably say, well, that, that can't be because you had a report you know, last year that said you had five years or, you know, whatever it says, six years. So uh, I think, uh, I, I, I honestly can't tell you that the, legis the, the legislation is clear on that, um, but presumably if you have that inspection and if we were doing, engaging in interpretation of an ambiguous statute and you have a report that says, my roof has got five years of useful life, then the carrier is not going to be able to come back over that next five years and say all else things, all other things being equal, no other change conditions, there hasn't been a major storm and, and, and your roof, you know, hasn't been impacted somehow in the, that five year period of time, then presumably you would be able to make that argument. Uh, but that's a big, big leap because, you know, year over year, what can the carrier come back and say, well, you know, Within the last year, we had two major storms, or uh, you know, we we went back and looked at it, and conditions are a little bit different now. So, good question. I don't know that there's an easy answer to it. Yeah, the the insurance agents will chime in. Well, we're gonna we're gonna close up shop shortly. Um, the one question that I wanted to respond to was, you know, is there a chance that the legislation is going to be stayed uh, on the basis of a court challenge? Maybe portions of it. It's possible, like the insurance portion, but with what happened in Surfside and the pressure that got put on legislators, uh, I don't think any circuit court judge is going to stay the entire legislation based upon uh, an attack. Because again, circuit judge doesn't want to be the one to have said these things don't can't go into effect, and all of a sudden there's another collapse, and everybody looks at that judge and says it's only because of you that this occurred. So I don't think that's gonna happen. Uh, get prepared to comply with the terms of the statute. Um, I wanna uh, thank, as usual, uh, Michelle Colburn for being the engineer behind the scenes of, of this presentation. Um, John and, and Brian um, for their efforts in, in preparing this. Brian does all our PowerPoint work so he did a, did a fine job with that. We thank him for that. So we're going to close off. Any questions that you have, you can email them to us. Uh, the ones that we can answer, we'll answer via email. Uh, if your question is too far in depth, we'll probably tell you to contact your general counsel. Uh, 
uh, uh, especially if it's outside of our field of expertise. But thanks everybody. Um, hope uh, you know a little bit more about this uh, statute than the did before. And very sorry if we scared anybody, but that's our job as lawyers, right? Okay. All right, everybody have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>